Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of February 26th, 2024. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.10 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we discuss a recent tweet from former Governor Walker's chief of staff that explains why some are so strenuously opposed to constitutionalizing the PFD, even though doing so would be better for the overall Alaska economy and would lower the cost of government to 80% of Alaska families. Second, we discuss the continued growth of Alaska corporate welfare, funded by even deeper PFD cuts and how even Republicans are engaged in it. And third, we try to better define the Cook Inlet gas issue in an effort to help identify the best solution, not just the most expedient one. And now, let's join Michael. We're going to start off with uh, your weekly top three, Brad, first and foremost. They are now saying the quiet part out loud. What exactly do? What exactly does that mean? So I got into a <clears throat> Twitter exchange with Scott Kendall. Woo, uh, Scooter. Woo, Scooter Kendall. <laughs> uh, governor Walker's former, former Governor Walker's chief of staff, last chief, second chief of staff, um, about uh, HJR 7, about uh, Ben's uh, constitutional amendment to constitutionalize the PFD. Not at a certain amount, but at what the legislature determines from time to time uh, by statute. And... Um, he started out with a uh, very strong uh, uh, comment that uh, the legislature shouldn't pass HJR 7, uh, that it would uh, uh, do bad things. And then I, my response was, that's false. Um, all HJR 7 does is take away the legislature's ability to use the worst possible funding mechanism, the funding me- PFD cuts, the funding mechanism that has the... Uh, has the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy and on 80% of Alaska families. And all that's all it did. It didn't set a PFD. It just took away the legislature's authority, uh, ability to use the worst. And then Scott came back with a, with a response that I think uh, is just sort of classic. It says, in a perfect world, I'd agree with you, but they need to fix the formula, raise new revenue first. Constitutionalizing the current formula guarantees a permanent $1 billion deficit. Do you think that would lead to the passage of more equitable revenue or more cuts to things like K through 12? And here's why I think that's, that's, that's an admission against interest, as lawyers would say, or it's saying the quiet part out loud, uh, as I put it in my column last week in the Alaska Landmine. What Scott's saying is we can't fund the things we're funding if you take away the P, if you take away our ability to divert the PFD, because yeah. because we don't think we can raise the same amount of revenue through other means through taxes, more equitable taxes, we don't think we can raise the same amount of revenue, nearly the same amount of revenue using other methods than we can uh, using PFD cuts. Essentially, so you, saying, essentially saying we couldn't squeeze the people for this much money without a revolution, and so. There you go. Exactly right. That's that's the thing that you and I have been talking about for a long time, which is which is what the PFD does is is in a very non-transparent way, 
allow the government to take money from Alaska families and to use it uh, for government spending. If they had to do it through a more transparent way, a way that that said this is a tax rate as opposed to just, you know, we're just shuffling money around. This is this is what we're taking from Alaska families in a transparent way. And if they had to do it in a way that was broad based, which would raise money not only from middle and lower income Alaska families, Alaska families, which is what the PFD cuts, PFD cuts do, but also from non-residents, also from the top 20 percent and likely also from the oil companies, if they had to do it in a way that hit those groups, then they wouldn't be able to raise the same amount of revenue. And what they're essentially admitting is, look, we've got an advantage with PFD cuts because it's money that's already that we've already got control over, just like your uh, financial advisor has control over your investments and and the money sometimes comes to him before and he sends it on to you. Just like just like that, the the the, the legislature's got control over PFDs and and to give that away. And to and to have to resort instead to more transparent, more broad-based approaches, they don't think they could raise the same amount of revenue. So what's so what he admitted is what's really going on here is the gov is those in favor of government spending, without regard to the impact on Alaska families. Those in favor of government spending want to continue to use PFD cuts because they can spend more than they than they think they could if they had to do it in a more transparent, uh, more broad-based way. Those, those who say, okay, go ahead and take our PFDs are essentially saying, go ahead and build government. Build government up to the amount of the full PFD, which is billions of dollars. Go ahead and build, and build government up that amount. We don't care. Go ahead and take our PFD. When, when If we did it in a more transparent, more broad-based way, uh, we would have less government. We would control government spending because they admit uh, they admit that they don't think they could raise the same amount of revenue. It, it's a it's something that I've long speculated uh, was going on here, long thought was going on here. Uh, but Scott Kendall just you know let it out of the bag, let the cat out right. of the bag, said said right. the quiet part out loud. Yeah, no, I mean, Ben and I were talking, Ben Carpenter and I were talking about this yesterday, and he was talking specifically about, you know, this idea in economics where you have that felt, uh, you know, you have the, the difference between the money that's essentially intercepted on its way to you. And this is the Milton Friedman, you know, payroll tax thing, where if you know the money's coming to you, but you don't get it all, it's one thing. But if you get all the money and then you have to pay the tax on it, it's a whole different critter, right? I mean, mentally and intellectually, you feel it a lot more because you got the hundred dollars and now you got to pay $30 back versus you just got $70 to begin with. You saw, you know, it's a, it's an, it's a, it's a mental thing uh, more than anything else. And that's kind of what we're facing right now where for people have been like, well, I was going to get $4,000, but now I'm only going to get a thousand. Oh, I mean, it sucks, but at least it's a thousand that I didn't have before, kind of thing. Whereas if they'd gotten a four thousand and then got issued a three thousand dollar tax bill, I, I've often said that in the state that if they taxed, if they gave all the people in the state the revenue, all the all the revenue that they deserved, like they, they just split up all the monies that the state got, paid it to all the people, and then issued them a tax bill, there would be a revolution tomorrow. You know what I mean? Because if you got if you got a check for eighteen thousand dollars, and then they came back and said, "Oh, by the way, we need a check back from you for sixteen thousand dollars," I mean, there would be a revolution in this state. Yep, exactly right, Michael. And, and that's but but it's it's effectively what's going on. I mean, effectively, Alaskans are due to to use your numbers are 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 due the four thousand dollars, or for a family of four, the sixteen thousand dollars. But the legislature is taking away, you know. $3,000 of that per Alaskan or $15,000 per family before it gets to you. It's a withholding. I mean, think about it as a withholding tax uh, right. that's, uh, that, that's going on, a withholding and diversion, just like withholding is for, uh, uh, for uh, out, of your, out of your wages or out of your, out of your other income. Um, it's a withholding tax, but it's not transparent in a way that, that causes, you're right, causes that same reaction. What, what, Scott Kendall admitted 
is that if they if we had that transparent transaction, if we had the 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 the, the transparency of that four thousand dollars in your pocket, and then the government taking three thousand dollars away, they wouldn't be able to raise the three thousand dollars. They right. would be able to raise much less. So you know what what this what this means is for those who want to who, for those who really you know think about it what hjr7 is is a spending is a spending constraint it is it is the creation of transparency for for what the pfd would be and then the creation of transparency for what government is trying to take away uh when they when they have to do it, it it's 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 that it's other things too it's lessening the burden on alaska families because the other ways the government would have to take that money away is through a broad-based approach that would reduce the impact on middle and lower income Alaska families. It's a lot of things. It's a lot of positive things. So when you listen to the HJR debate, and I and and I think that got delayed uh, according to the yeah, according to the records, got, it got delayed till tomorrow or yep. maybe further, given what the governor did yesterday on the education bill. Yeah. Um, uh, when you listen to the HJR seven debate on the floor, listen or when you read the articles about it. When people like Andy Josephson said, well, we just can't do, uh, we just can't, you know, uh, uh, give away the PFD. We just can't constitutionalize the PFD. We need to be able to snatch that money first. Listen to that, not only in the context of they need to be able to snatch money, but what they're arguing for is the ability to snatch more money away from Alaska families than they would be able to do under more transparent, under more transparent methods. That's the, that's the giveaway that's the silent part that Scott Kendall gave away with uh, with his tweet, and I think it's important. I think it's a, I, I think it's, I think it's a whole new level of understanding about what's going on in the minds of those who want to cut the PFD. They want they want higher government spending. Right. They view PFD cuts as a way of funding that higher, a, a non transparent way of funding that higher government spending, and they're concerned if they can't do it that way, if they have to raise the money other ways. They're not going to be able to raise that same level of government of government revenue, right? Which is one of the again, it's one of the protections that HGR seven offers, and it's why you should call your legislators and encourage them to vote for it when it comes up here shortly. I read that whole I read that whole interchange between you and Kendall, and uh, I mean, these big government people, man, that's just um, the the whole. Their whole way of life is wrapped up in what's going on in government and how can we protect that above all else? It's just, it's astonishing to watch, quite honestly. It really is astonishing to watch this kind of, uh, the mental, some of the mental gymnastics they have to go through to try and justify this kind of stuff. There, there was a later, down in the exchange, there was another exchange with somebody else, I forget who, who was essentially arguing, oh, but it's good for taking the PFD is good for middle and lower income Alaska families because we're spending it on things uh, that benefit them. So if somebody's trying to tell you that it's good for you, they're, that they're charging you double to do something that's good for you, they could charge you half uh, to do what they're doing for you, which is, which is essentially the re relationship between raising government revenue through governor, government revenue through PFD cuts versus other broad based approaches. When they're trying to tell you they're doing something good for you, but taking double your money to do it for you. That just does that. That doesn't sound right. I'm really trying to help you out here. Just give me, give me double the amount of money that you would have to pay somebody else. Give me, you know, that money and I'll help and I'll help you out. I'll sprinkle some fairy dust back on no, you. It's like, it's like mugging you for your own good. I'm just going to just take all your money. I'll give it back later. Only part of it, but it'll take care of you. So just give me all your money mugging for it's it's mugging for a cause that's what it is and, I, and i'll give it back to you in ways that let me employ a lot of union employees and 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 let me you know decide who gets the money back um uh, through these through these additional government employees um and it'll be the people that you know that i want to favor that that will vote for me and it's just i mean it's just that that part also was a little was 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 a little eye opening that people would actually say that out loud, uh, but uh, but but you know that that whole string was just one one odd argument after another. Yeah, no, definitely educational uh, to see that for sure. Have you been watching this debate? Did you watch the debate on the education thing and then the governor's 
reaction to it by any chance? I did. I did. Yeah. And, and I and that appears to have thrown the legislature into another do loop. I don't know. I well, mean, well like- I mean, what did he expect? I mean, he was very clear early on. I mean, it, 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 more clear than he usually is when he said, this is what I want to see in this education bill, including the bonuses and everything else. And I mean, fair warning kind of thing is what I felt like. But this government, this governor has had round heels. I mean, he said the same thing about PFDs, right? He said the same thing about, he, he sounded the same on, on other things. And then when push came to shove, he's just sort of leaned backwards and said, okay. And I think, you know, I think the legislature has gotten in the mode of, hey, as long as, as long as we can give him some cover. I mean, we put intent language in there that we want some of it used for bonuses. Right. My God, intent language. If I hear one more thing about intent language, uh, I'm sorry. I I think they anticipated he would have round heels about it. So uh, the fact he's standing up has got to be a shock. Yeah, no, it's going to be interesting to see. This could consume the entire rest of the session at this point, uh, which will, well, it's going to be interesting. It's going to be interesting to watch, to say the least. This battle is far from over, I would think, at this point. The Michael Duke Show, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. The real brains behind the Tuesday weekly top three. Uh, he comes in to give us the verbal beating every week. It's a it's but it's gentle with love and Christian kindness. That's the kind of beating that we get from Brad. Uh, trying to lay the truth bomb on us. Uh, we're on to uh, we're on to number two uh, for the weekly top three, which uh, includes a discussion about one of my favorite topics: corporate welfare. Well, Brad, um, I mean, I have. This is a state that has become so dependent on corporate welfare. I mean, it's been it's been it's been a factor in Alaskan politics for 40, 45 years, and it just keeps getting more and more blatant. I think probably the one when it really got caught my ire was back in uh, 10, 15 years ago when uh, GCI and Ron Duncan and they mm-hmm. spent two billion, or excuse me, two million dollars trying to convince Alaskans that they didn't need their PFD. And I'm like, why is this company spending two million dollars? And then I started following the money and realized, oh, well, it's because that's their gravy train. Their gravy train is the government spend. So uh, I'm sorry. Let, let, I'll let you take the floor here, but this is this is one of my pet peeves. Well, that was that's a great example. That was an early phase of uh, we can spend your PFD better than you can. We can spend it on Ron Duncan's GCI, uh, uh, expanding broadband or expanding whatever the heck it is he wanted to expand at the time. Uh, let us just take your PFD and we'll and we'll give it to Ron and everything. Everybody will be better. We're 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 doing good for you by taking this money from you and, and spending it for you on, uh, on something that we're paying double, uh, but we're spending it on something that we think is good. And, and we, and, and it just keeps continuing. The latest example and the one that, that caused me to put this on this week's top three is, um, is the governor's proposed quote, Alaska affordability act. And what the governor's proposing to do is to create a tax credit for corporations who, who fund, child care who fund child care for their employees or fund housing for their employees or help their uh, uh, the employees reduce their mortgage costs or all sorts of a variety of things but that's nothing more than more corporate welfare the tax the the, the what, what the governor's proposing to do is to reduce taxes now potentially by up you know more than 200 million dollars reduce taxes on corporations and that'll create a hole in the in the budget so what's going to fill that hole? We know the answer to this. Increased PFD cuts is going to fill that hole to, to, to go in and, 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 and pay the revenue. So essentially what the governor is proposing is to take a bunch more PFD money than he would otherwise need to do, than the government would otherwise need to do, to fill a hole so the governor can sprinkle some fairy dust on, on corporations uh, who are doing certain things. It's government, it's government spend through corporations. So the government, so what the governor's proposing to do is to take these PFDs to fill, to backfill the, the revenue hole created by the tax cuts for these corporations. So these corporations can go out and do what the government thinks is a good thing, corporate child care and, uh, uh, and corporate uh, subsidized 
uh, housing and 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 other things that the corporations think think they can do. It is it is a government program being administered through the corporations, government funded by additional PFD cuts to backfill uh, the reductions in corporate income taxes that the that the corporations uh, would be paying. I mean, there's 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 a variety of things uh, that that are concerning about that. I mean, what what the governor is doing is allowing these corporations to select to get a competitive advantage in the market to select their employees for for these benefits as opposed to as opposed to all Alaska families. If general if it's, benefits, right, for the general public. If it's a good thing that we ought to be doing this, then we ought to be doing it. I, I, I don't think it's necessarily a good thing, but if it's a good thing that we ought to be doing this, we ought to be doing it on a broad-based basis, not just for these corporate select employees. And if it's a good thing, we ought to be raising, and if it's a, it's going to benefit you know, Alaska generally in terms of making Alaska more affordable and more competitive and, 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 and help business out and, and bring in more employees, if it's, if it's a generally good thing, we ought to be funding it generally across the board uh, from all income classes and, and from non-residents as well. Uh, as as instead of just funding it from middle and lower income Alaska families through uh, through PFD cuts, so it's it's just another form uh, of corporate welfare uh, that uh, that the government's proposed this time from <clears throat> Governor Dunleavy himself. Yeah, well, and 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 the opening, you know, one of the one of the comments that the governor made on this really kind of bothered me because he said. In justifying what he's talking about, he said the private sector is far more equipped to solve these challenges than the government. He says the bill's a catalyst to set in motion voluntary development by the private sector, which <clears throat> sounds a lot like the free markets can take care of it. The problem is, is that what we've got is we've got a manipulated free market where the government is controlling, uh, you know, again, instead of being broad based, it's the government controlling this. And so it's not truly a private sector, as you said. It's choosing out just a small section, and 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 again, this is my whole problem with this whole discussion on, um, you know, subsidized childcare, subsidized housing for your employees. Now the now the private companies are going to get involved, which is going to create that hole in government, and they're going to ask for even more. So it just continues to manipulate and cause problems. It does. It does. I mean, if it's good for the corporations to do it, they ought to do it. And, it, and if it's a routine cause of business, a routine cost of business, they can deduct it against against their taxes as a routine cost of business. What the governor's doing is allow is creating this special program that allows them to to get a, a tax credit out of it, which is much more important than a tax deduction, a tax credit out of it. Uh, and um, and 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 have a government funded program, essentially a government funded program. Uh, for uh, for those for those select corporations that are that that choose to do it, Th that that sort of pales, <laughs> that sort of corporate welfare paled in comparison, though, by the end of the week, to to a second uh, proposal out there put by put out by Kenai Senator Jesse Bjorkman, that proposed to do this. It 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 he he put in a bill to pass a statute that would allow the state by eminent domain to acquire what are called overriding royalty interests in the Cook Inlet, specifically in the Cook Inlet. Overriding royalty interests are privately held uh, uh, royalty interests that are that have the benefit of not having to contribute to costs, don't have costs deducted from them. So they're sort of like a, a, a well, a royalty, a premium that goes to those holders of those. It's a gross royalty. royalty instead of a net royalty, essentially. Right. Right? Yeah, very good. And, and, and Bjorkman wants to set up a system where the government by eminent domain, which means that it's not a negotiation. It's just the government saying, we're going to take this property, right? It's just like coming in and taking any piece of property, government coming in and taking any piece of property. We're going to take it. The court will set how much we're going to pay you, but we're going to take it. Allows the, allows the, the, the state to come in by eminent domain to take these overrides. Um, and then under separate statutory authority, already existing statutory authority, the government, once it owns a royalty interest, it can it can waive it, or it can re, it can reduce it, or it can completely waive it for the benefit of the for the benefit of the of the producer. So what Bjorkman's really doing is allowing the government to come in, take these overrides, pay whatever the court 
uh, 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 requires for the for the value of the override, and then to waive the royalty. This is all. There's an article in the Landmine last week that that focuses on this. This is all for the purpose, really, of giving John Hendricks uh, a way out of some of the cost burden that he's incurring with respect to his Cook Inlet fields. And there's there's an override sitting on those Cook Inlet fields that the Hendricks claims is a is a is a burden on burden to his business that he has to pay those overrides. So what Bjorkman is doing is setting up for Hendricks the ability of the state to come in and acquire those overrides that are such a burden. Now, in that step, nothing much happens because now the state becomes the owner of it. But then under separate statutory authority, the state can waive, can reduce or waive the royalty and uh, and take that burden away from Hendricks. Hendricks still gets the profits, but it's just that the state would absorb the costs uh, uh, for Hendricks uh, from from those fields, and these are these overrides were negotiated, uh, are privately negotiated uh, arrangements that that occurred in part through the bankruptcy that uh, that, that Fury went with went through before Hex, Hex acquired before Hendricks's corporation acquired uh, the interest. They're privately negotiated, privately established overrides approved by the state at one point because the state has to approve overrides on on state leases approved by the state at one point, um, privately negotiated, it allows the, the the state to come in. Bjorkman's bill would allow the state to come in and acquire it. Talk about corporate welfare. I mean, it's a bailout of John Hendricks, uh, 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 setting up a bailout of John Hendricks in a, in a big time way, taking away his costs uh, and allowing him to keep the profits. Which, I mean, again, I've just, I've just shaken my head. I mean, again, creating... Uh, you know, more loss for the state in the long run, I'm assuming, that they wouldn't receive any of the royalties at that point because they've overridden and then written them off. Is that is that? Yep. So yep. Backfilled by PFD cuts. Yeah. Backfilled by again, by more PFD cuts. Uh, I, you know, I just at this point, Brad, I, I don't know. What is it going to take? Is it going to take a complete and full taking of the PFD for people to go, wait, what just happened? I mean, well, what just happened was the thing that Brad and I have been warning about for 10 years that they're going to take the PFD in its entirety. And then when that's done, they'll come to you and go, oh, you, you know, you Alaskans, free rides die hard. You guys really need to pay your fair share now. I mean, is it is this not what's coming in your opinion? Well, yeah, but, but it's the same thing, Michael. I mean, it's, it's stuff, stuff's going on. Stuff is going on. This, 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 this corporate uh, welfare on, on childcare and on housing. Um, uh, the the John Hendricks bailout stuff's going on because they're able to take the PFD non transparently, take the money through uh, uh, the PFD non transparently. Stuff that wouldn't happen if we had if we had other funding mechanisms that require that were transparent, so you saw what was going on and broad based. No one, I mean, if 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 somebody said you have to pay an increased tax. Um, uh, in order to fund John Hendricks's bailout, you have to pay an increased tax in order to give Conoco Phillips an improved competitive position in hiring employees because we're, they're going to be able to offer child state subsidized child care. You have to pay a tax to do that. People go, no, 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 no. Wait a second. <laughs> I'm not going to pay a tax to bail out John Hendricks. I'm not going to pay a tax to, to, to subsidize Conoco Phillips. But that's exactly what's going on only it's being done non-transparently through PFD cuts instead of transparently through through attacks. And that's what that's what Scott Kendall says. We don't want you to see it. We don't want you to see it. We don't want you to yeah. see yeah. what's going on behind the curtain because we know you wouldn't pay for it that right way. We want don't, to keep we want to keep it behind the curtain so we can keep it hidden. Don't take the cookie jar away from us. We really need that cookie jar. You just you you pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Eminent domain, the fact that they were so blatantly, you know, it's, oh, man, my head is going to explode. All I could say is thanks to all you people on the peninsula who put Jesse Bjorkman in there uh, to help us out. Uh, it's, just, it's just painful. I'm starting to wonder if people are just so exhausted by this whole thing that they're just, I mean, that they're just not even paying attention and throwing their hands up. I mean, the PFD argument seems to have gone super quiet. We've got HDR7, thank goodness, that that at least is up there. But it just seems like people are just like, whatever, just whatever. It it it, it feels that way in a lot of uh, 
in a lot of discussions that I've had over the last uh, couple of months that most people are just like, okay, whatever. I just want to move, you know, uh, I don't know if it's exhaustion or what, but this is a, this is a hot mess for sure, Brad. Well, without a, without a baseline, without something like HJR seven, that sets a baseline uh, on, on how much of the PFD you can take uh, sets it by statute on how much of the, of the PFD government can, can, withhold and divert to government spending without a baseline like that. It's a debate that goes on every year, right? It's a debate that, that, you know, uh, is just, is just a, a perennial uh, dogfight about, about what we're going to deal with it. We need to be able to draw a line under it and move on. But, but as Scott Kendall, you know, indicates in the, in the, in the Twitter exchange, they don't want to draw a line under it because they oh, know oh. They yeah. know they can just can continue as long as it's not not defined. They can just continue grabbing it. Just continue, yeah, to grow government by grabbing it. So no. it's in their interest not to define. It's in their interest not to not to end this debate. Just to keep it as an endless debate. Eight years of it being a political football. Essentially, it's as I said before. Every time it, it sucks up all the oxygen in the room. So it's all like, look at this. Here's the PFD. Look at this. Fight about this. And we're not paying attention to everything else. Meanwhile. People are getting exhausted fighting about the same thing over and over and over again. Fatigue is a real thing. You're right, Brian. I mean, the fatigue is a real thing. And, and what happens is you get you get more and more people sucked into, you know, things like Dunleavy's Alaska Affordability Act. Let's give a let's give bailouts to corporations to who you know want to retain employees, want to make themselves more competitive. Let's let's give them a, a subsidy. Uh, to do that, or you get, you know, Bjorkman's bill for, you know, to bail out John Hendricks. I mean, people go, I'm a conservative, I'm a Republican, I'm against government spending, but spend on this, spend on, spend on my favorite thing, spend on, spend on corporate right. welfare, spend right. on, spend on John Hendricks. But I'm really a conservative. I'm really hey. a you know, rock rib Republican. Yeah, no, hey, it's it's like you and I. I mean, we started asking this question ten years ago. 2014, you and I started asking this question of legislators. Would you be willing to follow the ICER proposal, the numbers of 4.1 billion? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. We're all about the cutting it and keeping it back. But don't cut in my district. Don't cut in my district, right? I mean, we saw the Republicans in the, the in the valley and everything else. Oh, yes, we're all for oh, but don't don't cut the ag department. Don't cut this, don't cut that. I mean, it's it's either got to be good for the goose or it's not. I mean, it's got to be, you know, it, it's uh, and that's the problem is that not everybody is willing to pony up and and take the take the pain. It's it, the cuts are good. The reductions are good as long as it's not me being reduced. Yep, exactly right. And, it, and it's and as long as we keep this issue open, as long as we don't have HJR seven or something like it, drawing a line underneath it and saying, move on, let's start fighting about the spending as opposed to fighting about, as you said, this squirrel over here, the PFD, as, as, as long as we don't have that, we're just going to, you know, people are just going to keep picking at it like Dunleavy with the corporate afford or the Alaska affordability act, or the corporate affordability Act, with the Alaska affordability act, or we're going to have Bjorkman with John Hendricks's bailout. We're, we're going to have people who are going to say, Oh, you know, everybody else is doing it. And, and I want my guys to have some benefit from it too. So let's just pass this. And and P, cut the PFD a little bit more, and 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 direct it this way. Sprinkle the fairy dust over over in this direction. Yeah, Think, no. things they wouldn't be. And Scott Kendall just said the quiet part out loud. Things they wouldn't be able to do. Things that we wouldn't spend money on if it wasn't for the fact that we that they were using PFD cuts to do it. If they had to do it in a more transparent, more broad based way, they wouldn't be doing it. But because we've got this PFD you know, kitty out there. They just keep drawing from it a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. Everybody. I, we got to get ours before the getting's good, right? While the getting's <laughs> good. We got to get, somebody's going to spend that money. Might as well be us is kind of the reaction that we hear a lot of times. Uh, it's, it's just, it's so, it's so frustrating, Brad, especially since again, everything that we predicted that we've talked about since 2013, uh, 2014 has all come to pass and it just continues to get worse. And I, I just, I just don't even know what to say at this point. Uh, don't go weary, Michael. I mean, yeah. don't, don't go weary because yeah, yeah. you can't grow well during, but 
people will just keep taking more and more money from it until, as you say, it's all gone. I, yeah. w- y- y- the effort to draw to draw the line is is an important one and one we've got to stay at. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Our guests, the final segment of the weekly top three. An hour goes so fast. Uh, we're on to the real things with the Cook Inlet oil and gas um, with uh, John Hendrickson and all the things that are happening. Like you said, it got a little bit of a back burner last week because of the uh, – discussions on the education spend so where are we at and what are your thoughts on it for this week michael i i think i think we need to focus on better there's a lot of stuff going on a lot of proposals being out there being made out there with the cook inlet there's a lot of commentary on the cook inlet yesterday there was a presentation by the alaska gas line development corporation that said hey we got a solution we'll just build we'll pre-build this line down from the slope uh, down to uh, Cook Inlet, and we'll supply North Slope gas uh, down to the Cook Inlet. Don't look behind the curtain on how much it costs, <laughs> but but we'll pre-build this line down, and 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 we'll ha- we'll solve the problem. So, you know, everybody's coming out coming out of the woodwork with a solution on how to on how to solve the problem. I'm not sure we've defined the problem well, though. I mean, people seem to think the problem is just physically showing up with gas. Uh, any proposal that physically shows up with gas. From an Alaska source is a good is a good solution, and we ought to be we ought to be doing that. That's not what the economics tell you. The ep- economics tell you that that physical the physical supply of gas isn't really a problem after a certain point of time, and I'll come back to that. The physical supply of gas isn't a problem after a certain point of time. That we can bring LNG in, plenty of LNG liquefied natural gas on the market on the global market. We can bring it in and supply it. So the physical supply isn't the problem. The problem is the economics. And, and, and here's how I think we ought to be thinking about this issue. LNG is the, is, the, is the ultimate showstopper. It's the one that can supply the whatever amount of gas we need and, and resolve the, the physical supply issue. Cost of LNG, according to a study done last year uh, uh, by economic consultants uh, presented to the RCA, uh, is about twelve dollars. John Sims, president of NSTAR, said in his latest uh, uh, legislative testimony, it's twelve to fifteen dollars. I think what he's trying to do is blow it up a little bit to make some room for for some other solutions. But but let's say it's twelve to fifteen dollars. What we ought to be looking at are solu- is are there solutions that are economically lower cost than that? If there are, we ought to pursue them. If they aren't economically lower cost than that. Even if they're from Alaska sources, then then we ought to exclude them because the focus of this ought to be let's get the lowest cost of supply into Alaska. Here's one of the things that wasn't discussed at the at the at the big Cook Inlet uh, uh, legislative hearing a few weeks ago. There's a chart in the presen- in the in the study that the ec- economists did that was presented to the RCA that wasn't in the slide deck presented to the legislature. And that chart looks at the marginal cost of supply from Cook Inlet sources. It doesn't, doesn't include the North Slope. We'll right. talk about that in a minute. But it, it looks at the marginal cost of supply of additional supplies from the Cook Inlet uh, sources. And it says that going out and, and incentivizing or trying to bring on additional supplies from the Cook Inlet market the, there, it comes in two tranches. First tranche is uh, uh, one, sort of a near-term incremental uh, in, increase in supply. The second one is sort of a longer-term increase in supply. And it said, the study said, the incremental cost of supply from that from the from the near-term Cook Inlet sources is nine to nineteen dollars in MCF. And the incremental cost of supply from longer term sources, Cook Inlet sources, is fifteen to twenty six dollars in MCF. So the the first one outstrips the 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 median price, the the average price in the first tranche outstrips the average price for for uh, uh, for LNG. The the even the low end of the price for the second tranche. Uh, outstrips the medium, the average price for LNG. So there are, there may be additional Cook Inlet co- supplies 
but they are at a price that are beyond, that's beyond the cost of LNG. What, what we need to do and what this study did, what the study did for the, for the RCA that the legislature only got a part of from the economists, what the study did was say, here's, here's the various layers of supply options. And LNG, when you look at the layering of supply options, LNG is the lowest cost of supply to get the additional supplies that you, that you say you need in order to supply Alaska long-term. That should be the baseline. And LNG can start, um, as at what Sim said was LNG starts in 2030. The latest estimate is starting in 2030. Now, we may have a supply dip before 2030. And before we can get LNG in, and and we may and we should be talking about how we fill that supply dip economically before before 2030. And there's various options to do that. There's there's short term LNG options. There's maybe we need to, to to provide an incentive for some supplemental supplies from the Cook Inlet. But but once you get to 2030, LNG looks like it's the lowest cost option. What we need to do is define the issue in the uh, in in the Cook Inlet, as opposed to you know all of these various. Oh, I can bring it. It may cost twenty dollars, but I can bring supply down from the North Slope. We need to we need to set an economic analysis of what the various supply options are. Look at when that supply option kicks in. If it's LNG, look at when that supply option kicks in. And if there is a deficiency, if there's a, a problem on supply before then, look again at the various short-term options on how to fill that before we fill in. The last thing we need to do, frankly, is to do something like the like bringing gas down from the North Slope, which is a permanent solution, but a permanent solution that costs way the heck more than LNG. Right. So, I mean, the last so, price that I heard for the gas line was something like $47 billion. So, I mean... Come on. I mean, it, that's not economical. I mean, yes, we have 17 trillion cubic feet of gas on our slope. Great. I agree. It's a huge supply. We should do something with it when it's economic. But 45 or $46 billion for a pipeline to get it to Tidewater, that number doesn't pencil out on the per MCF cost. Well, in yesterday's presentation, they they stripped it down and they, and they got it down to about $11 billion. They stripped that. They stripped out the, the the kit on the North Slope that is needed to deal with the Prudhoe Prudhoe Bay gas CO2 problem. It's rich in CO2. Can't bring that down the pipe, so they had to build a plant up there. They stripped that plant out, which means in essence they're going to bring the gas from Point Thompson, and they stripped out the liquef the cost of the liquefaction plant down in Kenai, um, and they stripped out all the compressors. I don't know. I'm not sure how you're going to move this gas without compressors, but but they stripped out all the compressors. So basically they stripped it down to just the pipe, the cost of the pipe coming from the North Slope down to the down to the Cook Inlet. And that's a, and and they said yesterday in yesterday's presentation that's eleven billion dollars. Still, when you do the cost of service on eleven billion dollars, that's in excess of the of the twelve to fifteen uh, from LNG. So it's we need to start looking at the economics and we need to look seriously when people say, Oh, all we need to do is incentivize additional cook inlet production. We need to look at this chart that the legislature didn't look at, that wasn't in the legislative presentations. We need to look at this chart that talks about what the cost is of these, of these additional supplies. And it's not just, oh, you know, John Hendricks saying, oh, I'll sell you gas for $9 if I don't have to pay my overrides. You know, if the state will just, you know, uh, uh, eminent domain the overrides and, and waive them, I, I can send it to you for $9. That's not the true cost. The true cost is the $9 plus the cost to the state of, of, of doing eminent domain on the overrides and then and then waiving those overrides, the subsidy that's created by doing that. That's there's an additional cost there to the state that needs to be added on. We need to come, we need to, we need to focus on the economics as, as we go forward. It's good to have a hearing that had, you know, 50,000 different solutions out there. It's good to have bills, I suppose, that have 50,000 different solutions. But now, now that we're you know, dealing with the problem, we need to define the problem as an economics problem, not a physical supply problem because we've got the physical supply problem solved as an economics problem. And then we need to look at the lowest cost supply for the various time periods uh, uh, to, 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 meet the, to meet the demand.
Is this fixable, Brad? Less, so we got just over 60 seconds. Is this fixable for real if they got serious about it? Yes. Yes. Physical supplies available in the world. Yes. It's fixable. We just have to import it. We have to quit looking at Alaska gas and just look at the import in the long term, in the short term, and in the long term, right? We need to look at the most economic supply. And, and, and what the charts are telling you is the most economic supply over the long term is LNG. That's why I, I'm not I'm not saying LNG first. What I'm saying is the most economic supply. And once you impose that that criteria, then LNG follows from that. If Alaska were lower cost supply, great. But it's the total Alaska cost. It's the cost of the utility plus the cost of the subsidy that the state's proposing to throw on top of that. We need to look at the most economic supply overall, period, and then and then go with that, get on with that. All right, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, the weekly top three. Uh, Brad, where can people find that chart? Uh, it's in uh, my column uh, the week before last, my Friday column on the Alaska landmine the week before last. I think the title of that column is, is Alaska on its way to mimicking Venezuela. Okay. And, uh, and the charts in that column. Tom McKay in the chat room says, send us the chart, Brad. Why didn't they get that chart during the presentations? I, I mean, I'm, well, I'm curious. Tom, yeah. go, go to the Alaska landmine, go to the, go to the uh, chart of the week. It's a heading up there. Click on it and go to the chart, go to the column for February 16th. Um, <clears throat> and then, and then he doesn't want to hear this again, but call the economists, <laughs> have, have the economists testify before the, before the committee. Right. Well, I mean, to me, I would love to see Alaskan gas in Alaskan households, uh, you know, being used. I would love that, but it has to make economic sense. And unfortunately, Although I've been a huge proponent of a gas line for Alaska, it's got to make economic sense. It just can't, you know, and maybe we could have built it years ago uh, at the time and been able to do it. But now there's gas fines all over the world and LNG is just, it's it's just cheaper to bring it in at this point than it is to do anything else. Actually, LNG, I, I, I do a chart every Monday uh, uh, for the chart of, for the Alaska, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, chart of the, chart of the day. We do charts of the day. Uh, early in the morning and we do and then the monday's chart is on uh global gas it's on the cost of global gas looking at the futures markets the cost of global gas versus the cost of 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 nstar because i just want to see what the relationship is actually asian gas delivered to asian lng markets is now cheaper than than alaska gas, than nstar gas now that's sort of a you know we're, we're off peak we're not we're not during the the, the coldest winter months and and there's a lot of explanations for that, but it's not it's not necessarily the case that global LNG is is automatically the most expensive is, is automatically the most expensive option. I mean, people try to dismiss it that way. Oh God, we wouldn't uh, LNG just that's just so expensive. It's not. I mean, we've got a huge amount of LNG. A lot of it that was developed, a lot of that that was that's being developed for Europe as a result of the L, of, of the Russian uh, situation. But we've just got a lot of LNG that's going on in the world right now. A lot of LNG export capacity that's going on in the world right now. It's not a solution that Alaska, you know, you're right. It'd be great to have Alaska gas and Alaska homes, but not if it, not if it ends up costing Alaskans more than than other right. than other well, options. And and part of the problem, and this is discussed, we just I think I don't know if it was with you, but I've just we I discussed this years ago, was the problem is even if we decide to build a plant, and let's just say it's bare bones and it's fifteen billion dollars to build a, a line, compress, you know, do everything else, do all that kind of stuff. The problem is is that once we lock it in, even if it's at a higher rate, and we're saying, oh, we'll be willing to pay that higher rate in the short term to make sure we're using our gas supplies, and but we've locked ourselves into that for. 20 or 30 years. And if something else changes out there and all of a sudden world LNG supplies goes down to, you know, two or three bucks per MCF and we're paying 12 or 15, all of a sudden we're like, well, wait a second, we've locked ourselves into this forever. And uh, it, it's, I mean, it becomes completely unsustainable in the long run. It does. And the only way, the only way you possibly could ever think about making the big line, a, a line from the North Slope down to the Cook Inlet down to down to South Central economic is if it takes the entire South Central market. So so what you're essentially doing is saying we're not going to have any other options. We have now locked in 
on this option. If somebody finds additional cook inlet supplies, too bad. We've locked in. We to make the economics work, we had to lock in on the on the North Slope supply, as opposed to LNG, as opposed to LNG imports, which are scalable. I mean, you can have zero LNG. You have to build the kit. You have to pay for the kit, the import kit. But you can have zero if, if somebody had a big cook inlet find. You can back out all the LNG and just say we're not going to order any any tankers, uh, and and supply it from Cook Inlet again. So LNG gives you a flexibility that that some of these that some of these other options don't. I mean they they lock you in on on long term a long term a long term contract that you're not you're not walking away from, and you've right. made and and that has the potential then to make South Central much economic. You're exactly right, ec, uneconomic for the long term as opposed to you know, just getting over this hump uh, and, uh, and and dealing with it from there. I mean, what's the, what do you think the possibilities are in the future of eventually Alaskan gas not being stranded, not being, up, you know, not being up there? Do they, do they put a plant on the North Slope and do, and do LNG exports from there? Do they, do they put a gas line in? I mean, you know, what, what are your thoughts on it here? we got about two minutes. We've got a race going on and the race is, I mean, it, it's a big supply, um, it, it, it would it would it would fit in the market, but there's a lot of other supplies being developed. Alaska LNG potentially could become ultimately economic, become ultimately enter the market. But the race is is are we going to phase out gas uses? Are we going to phase out hydrocarbon hydrocarbons uses globally? Are we going to replace it with renewables and other things? And so and so will Alaska become economic before the hydrocarbon age goes away? That's the race, and I. And I don't know the outcome of that race. I mean, if we're talking about, you know, having having, you know, reducing the amount of CO2 emissions by 2050, uh, that's going to take a lot of hydrocarbon reduction. And are we going to is there going to be a role for Alaska gas before then? Is there going to be a role after then? That's that's the that's the challenge that's going on. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for sustainable budgets. Final thoughts, Brad, here as we wrap up. Well, <laughs> Let's go back to Scott Kendall. Scott Kendall said the quiet part out loud. Alaskans need to understand what he's saying. What he's saying is we can spend more for government, a lot more for government, as long as we can use PFD cuts to fund it because it's non-transparent and it only hits middle and lower income Alaska families. If we have to do it transparently through a tax and if we have to do it transparently through a broad-based, a broad-based approach. We're not going to be able to spend that much for government. That is, that is Scott Kendall. That's a proponent of government spending. Speaking, people who, people on our side who say, "Oh, I can give up the PFD." What you're doing when you say that is you are permitting, enabling additional government spending, and you need to take that to heart. Brad, thank you so much. Appreciate it, my friend. It's good to talk with you. Thanks Michael, for coming. Always, up thanks here. for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.